very much. It's really a huge pleasure for me to be here. Many of the, uh, of the applications of cold molecules that we're also keen on uh, require long coherence times. And uh, we heard already this morning from Yuval about uh, uh, long uh, spin precession times, which are so important for uh, EDM measurements. And probably many of you know the wonderful work done at MIT demonstrating uh, second scale coherence times on the hyperfine transitions in molecules, uh, which of course is important because the hyperfine states can be used as storage qubits. And rotational coherences, uh, of course, are also very important for our field. So, as an example, if you want to couple the molecules together, you'd like to probably do that using the dipole-dipole interaction and to do that in a controlled way. And, and a good way to do that is to use the oscillating electric dipole moments that you have when the molecules are in superpositions of rotational states. That's what Eric already uh, showed us uh, uh, this morning already. So, in order to have high fidelity um, interactions of that kind, we would like to have long rotational coherence times. How long uh, is long enough? Well, let's think about a couple of examples. So, if I imagine taking a pair of molecules and they're in tweezer traps, and I bring them as close as I can together in the tweezer traps, which is probably about half a micron, um, then in that case, the strength of the dipole-dipole interaction is a few kilohertz. Another example would be uh, trapping molecules magnetically uh, close to the surface of a chip in microscopic magnetic traps and coupling the molecules to one another uh, via a superconducting microwave resonator. And in that case, you, you can expect to have uh, coupling strengths between the molecules of some tens of kilohertz. Okay, so in, in, in both examples, in order to have high fidelity quantum operations, you would like to have rotational coherence times that are, let's say, tens of milliseconds or preferably even longer. There's been quite a lot of work recently uh, looking at rotational coherence times in optical traps um, and uh, recent demonstrations showing that you can get uh, rotational coherence times of about 10 milliseconds in optical traps. I think we'll hear about that work tomorrow. Um, but there hasn't really been very much work on, on coherence times in magnetic traps, so that's what I want to tell you about today. So let me begin uh, just by telling you about some of the methods that we use uh, to make our cold molecules and put them into magnetic traps. So we use mainly calcium fluoride molecules and our experiments begin uh, with a magneto-optical trap of, of calcium fluoride. So the experiment is illustrated here. It starts over here on the left-hand side with a, with a cryogenic buffer gas source of these calcium fluoride molecules. So this source emits short pulses of molecules traveling at about 160 meter per second. We slow these molecules down using the radiation pressure of this counter-propagating laser light here. And this, uh, this laser light is frequency chirped in order to compensate for the changing Doppler shift as the molecules slow down. So then the molecules are decelerated. We decelerate them to about 10 meter per second. They arrive in the center of this vacuum chamber here and then we capture them in a magneto-optical trap. This slowing step of the experiment, uh, it requires just two, two lasers. Uh, so the main slowing light drives this zero to zero band of the B to X transition. It's at 531 nanometer. And then we use a single repump laser uh, to repump the population that decays to the, to the first vibrationally excited state of, of X here. So just two lasers. And then for the MOT, we use, we use uh, four lasers. The main cooling light drives this A to X transition. It's at 606.3 nanometers. And then we use another three lasers as repumps to repump the population that decays to the, to the higher lying vibrational states of X. Okay. So I won't go into the details of all of the energy level structure today, but let me just point out one important thing, uh, which actually Jun Yi already pointed out yesterday, so in all cases, uh, we drive a transition from the ground electronic state with one unit of rotational angular momentum up to the excited electronic state with no rotational angular momentum. Okay, so this n here is the rotational quantum number, and we drive the transition from, from n equals 1 to n equals 0 in all cases. So this works very well. Uh, here's a picture 
of uh, one of the first MOTs we ever made. Uh, it's a picture taken on the CCD camera here of the laser-induced fluorescence from the MOT. And uh, this MOT contains about uh, 2 times 10 to the 4 molecules. Uh, the density is 2 times 10 to the 5 per cubic centimeter. Temperature, uh, it's about 12 millikelvin. The trap frequency in the MOT, it, it's about 100 hertz. And the lifetime of the MOT is about 100 milliseconds. So this temperature here, this temperature is rather high, uh, and so the next, the, in order to, to get the molecules colder, the next thing we do is to apply subdoppler cooling. And again, Jun, you already pointed out yesterday that um, when you have this structure here, where you have more angular momentum in the ground state than you do in the excited state, then the subdoppler mechanism, the, the, the Sisyphus mechanism, requires blue detuned light. Okay, so for the MOT, of course, we're using red detuned light. Uh, the Sisyphus cooling requires blue detuned light. So that's the next thing we do. Uh, we go through the following steps. We first of all load the MOT at full laser intensity. That captures the, the, the largest number of molecules. And then we ramp the intensity down um, to about 1% of its initial value. That brings the temperature down uh, to, to a little bit below a millikelvin. And then we just switch off the magnetic field uh, of the MOT, uh, switch the lights to a positive detuning, typically about 20 megahertz, and then turn the intensity back up again, so that now the, the molecules are sitting in this blue detuned optical molasses. It's the gray molasses that, that Jun talked about yesterday. So this is a very effective at, at cooling the molecules to subdoppler temperatures. This is our measurement of the temperature coming down as a function of the amount of time they spend in the molasses. And very quickly, after half a millisecond or so, they pass below. This dashed line here is the, is the Doppler limit, 200 microkelvin for calcium fluoride. We measure the temperature um, by uh, the standard ballistic expansion method. Here's some pictures of a, of a, of a cold, ballistically expanding cloud. Um, and then we see a temperature typically of about 55 microkelvin. Now this temperature here, uh, this is limited by the random nature of the spontaneous emission, okay, which is a heating mechanism, of course. So ideally, we would like to turn that off. And, and a good way to turn that off is to, is to arrange for the slowest molecules to get optically pumped into dark states so they're no longer scattering photons once they're slow enough. So that's the next thing we do. We actually apply a second st stage here of subdoppler cooling. So let me explain how that works. The, what I'm showing you here, this is the laser cooling transition, going from the ground electronic state with n equals 1 up to the excited state with n equals 0. And there's some hyperfine structure. Okay, so this n equals 1 state here has four hyperfine components due to its coupling with the electron spinner half and the nuclear spinner half. And we add radio frequency sidebands to the laser light so that we can drive all four hyperfine components. Okay, it's essential to do that in order to make sure that the scattering rate is, is high enough that the MOT works and also actually that this first step of subdoppler cooling works. But now once we have the molecules down cooled to about 50 microkelvin, um, we actually just turn off the radio frequency sidebands so that we're left with just a single frequency of light here. Okay, and the single frequency is blue detuned from all of the transitions. Now, once we just have the single frequency of light, there are dark states in this system. Okay, and in particular, there are dark states amongst the F equals 2 levels here. For our particular polarization configuration, which, which is counter-propagating sigma plus, sigma minus beams, uh, there are two dark states. So there's this, this, this one, which is the superposition of the m equals minus 1 and the m equals 1 uh, state. Uh, and then the second dark state, which is the superposition of m equals minus 2, m equals 0, and m equals plus 2. So the molecules get optically pumped into these dark states. And now if the molecules are moving quickly enough, then they can non-adiabatically transfer out of the dark states. Okay, so so these, are, these are robust dark states for molecules at low velocity. Right, so it's a velocity-selective coherent population trapping. So these two ingredients, okay, we still have this blue detuned light, which is, a, which is giving a Sisyphus cooling, and we have this, uh, this, these velocity-selective dark states. Those are the ingredients you need to be able to cool to, to, to much lower temperatures. And here you see our measurement of the temperature um, coming down 
as a function of time uh, that we apply this second subdoppler cooling step. Once everything is optimized, we get a, a temperature of about 5 microkelvin. So now we have these cold molecules. Um, the next step is to uh, put them into a single quantum state um, and, then, and then trap them magnetically. So here again, this is the n equals 1 rotational state of the molecule with its four hyperfine components that I showed you on the last slide. Uh, and I've drawn in here the Zeeman sublevels of each state. And 20.5 gigahertz below is the rotational ground state, n equals zero. It has these two hyperfine components. So, so first of all, we optically pump uh, the majority of the molecules in just, into just a single state. We choose this state here, the f equals zero state. And then we actually drive this microwave transition here to drive the population down uh, to this state, f equals one, m f equals one. So the population is now shelved in the rotational ground state. We then apply a pulse of light, which just pushes away any population that remained in n equals 1, so that now we can be sure that we've got all the molecules in a single quantum state. And then actually, we typically transfer the population back up again to n equals 1, and we can choose which state we want to go to, but we would very often choose this state here, f equals 2, m f equals 2. Okay, so now we have molecules in a single quantum state that we can choose. And these states that I've selected here, this one and this one, you see they're weak field seeking states. So these are magnetically trappable states. So the next thing we do is to turn on a, a, a magnetic quadrupole trap, and that confines the molecules. This is a measurement of the loss rate out of the magnetic trap as a function of the amount of helium that we flow through the cryogenic source. Okay, so this cryogenic buffer gas source has helium flowing through it constantly. That helium is, is incident on the, on the magnetic trap. And the loss out of the magnetic trap is dominated by collisions with the helium. Okay, so you can see the loss rate depends linearly on the, on the helium flow rate here. And actually, we did this measurement with molecules in, in two different quantum states, this one here and this one here. Um, basically as a sort of proof of principle demonstration that we could do collision experiments with molecules in single selectable quantum states. So once we understood that the loss rate here was limited by this uh, flow of helium, we actually installed a helium shutter that, sh that shuts off the flow of helium once the molecules have passed through. And then, and then after installing this helium shutter, uh, we get a trap, a trap lifetime, uh, we get a loss rate down here, which corresponds to a trap lifetime of 4.5 seconds. Now, the molecules can be, can be excited. They can be vibrationally excited by, by black body radiation. And um, if you calculate what is the rate for that process for black body radiation at room temperature, it's this value here, 0.22 per second, which is exactly the loss rate that we're measuring. Okay, so the loss of molecules from the from the magnetic trap here is, is uh, dominated entirely by this black body heating process. Good, so now we have molecules in the magnetic trap. We can choose which state to put them in. Um, so now we start to prepare uh, superpositions of the, of the rotational states and look to see how long the coherence survives. If you want to do these two things, so we want to have magnetically trapped molecules and we'd like to have long rotational coherence times. Okay, that requires that we find states that have large Zeeman shifts so that we can magnetically trap them, trap the molecules. So large Zeeman shifts, but also identical Zeeman shifts for a pair of states, okay, so, that, so that there's uh, no dephasing in the system. Yeah. So I show you here again the um, n equals 1 rotational state, the lowest rotational state. This is the same as I showed on the last slide. I'll also put in, this is the second rotationally excited state, n equals 2, sitting 41 gigahertz. Above, it also has these four hyperfine components. And I've drawn in here some magnetic sublevels. And now let me just draw your attention to the states that I've highlighted in purple here. Okay, these are the stretch states of the system the states that have the maximum possible value of the projection quantum number for each rotational manifold. Um, and, and these stretch states, um, they, they have nothing else to couple to. Okay, so they have perfectly linear Zeeman shifts at all magnetic fields. And their Zeeman shifts are basically the same as that of a free electron. Okay, so the stretch states have magnetic moments very nearly equal to the Bohr magneton. The Zeeman shifts are 1.4 megahertz per Gauss. 
And that's true for all of the stretched states. Okay, so we should um, have magnetically insensitive transitions between these stretched states. For example, the two that I've drawn in here, they should be magnetically insensitive. And then that raises an interesting question. Okay, so how magnetically insensitive are these, are these transitions exactly? Okay. In order to answer that question, we need to take a look at the Zeeman Hamiltonian. So here it is. Let me just take you through this. So this first term here, S dot B, that's the normal electron spin interaction. You're all familiar with it. And that's, that's giving the 1.4 megahertz per Gauss. It's by far the dominant term in the Hamiltonian. And it, it's just the same for all of the stretch states. Okay. And then we have this term here going like I dot B. It's the nuclear spin interaction. Of course, it's much smaller. Um, and it's also the same for all of the stretch states. Then there's this guy here going like n dot b with the coefficient gr. This is coming from the very tiny magnetic moment that's associated with the rotation of the molecule. Yeah. And because it's associated with the rotation of the molecule, it depends on the rotational state. It depends on n. And then there's this other term here, which is usually called the, the anisotropic part of the electron spin interaction. Okay, it has the coefficient gl. It goes like s dot b minus s z b z. Z here is the is the internuclear axis. Okay, so this is expressing the idea that the res the, the response of the molecule to a, a magnetic field is a little bit different when the magnetic field is along the internuclear axis relative to perpendicular to the nuclear axis. This term also depends on the rotational state, depends on n. So from the Zeeman Hamiltonian, you can then very easily work out what is the um, what is the Zeeman shifts of, of these stretch states? And I write down here the difference um, b between them. Okay, so this is the Zeeman shift of the stretch state in manifold n plus 1 minus the Zeeman shift in the stretch state with, uh, in manifold n. Ideally, this would be 0. Okay, it's not 0. It gets a contribution from this term here going like gr and a contribution from this last term here going like gl. And this first, this first term has no n dependence, and this second term has some n dependence. Okay. okay, so we went about in the lab measuring the, the residual magnetic sensitivity of these transitions here. They're supposed to be almost, magneti almost magnetically insensitive, so to measure their residual sensitivity, you need to be able to measure um, small frequency shifts. We do that uh, by Ramsey interferometry. Okay, so here's some data. Um, showing some Ramsey fringes uh, as we scan the frequency of this 20.5 gigahertz microwave here. Um, and from data such as this, you can very accurately find the center frequency and then do that for various applied magnetic fields and find out the magnetic sensitivity. So here's the results for these two transitions here. So what we find is that on this lowest transition at 20.5 gigahertz, uh, we get a df by db of minus 105 hertz per gauss. You can express that in a different way. It means that the difference in magnetic moments between the lower state and the upper state is this number, minus 7.5 times 10 to the minus 5 Bohr magneton. And then this one here, this is the 41 gigahertz transition shown in red here. Uh, this df by db is just minus 4.6 hertz per gauss, uh, which means that the magnetic moments of the two states here and here uh, are equal to one another to within three parts, three parts per million. Okay, and that's now knowing these magnetic sensitivities, um, we can figure out what are the values of GL and GR, the parameters that appear in that Zeeman Hamiltonian. Uh, these are our experimental values. Our collaborators, uh, Jesus Aldegunda and Jeremy Hudson, uh, they've calculated these values for calcium fluoride, and they're also calculating for other molecules. And you see that the experiments and the theory are in good agreement. And then knowing these values of GL and GR, you can now deduce the magnetic sensitivity of all of the stretch transitions okay, between, for, for, for every N. So here's the answer. Uh, it's expressed here as the difference in magnetic moments between the, between the uh, lower and upper states. This blue point here, that's the lowest transition, the 20.5 gigahertz transition. And its magnetic sensitivity, it's actually dominated by the GL term. And then as you go up to high, high values of N, 
um, you get a plateau here. The, the sensitivity is dominated by the, by the GR term. And then here, this point here, which corresponds to the 41 gigahertz transition, these two contributions cancel each other almost exactly. Okay, so you have two small contributions that also cancel each other. And it's, and it's that that's, that's responsible for this tremendously insensitive transition here. Good. So then, um, of course, we wanted to see, well, what rotational coherence times can we really get in the magnetic trap? Um, so we did the measurements for both of these transitions. So here's some data showing uh, the coherence time on the 20.5 gigahertz transition. This is, these are Ramsey fringes, okay, as we scan um, the free evolution time between the two uh, pi by two pulses of the Ramsey sequence. Okay, so the, the microwave oscillator um, is, is slightly detuned from the rotational transition, and we just see the beat note between the oscillations of the, micro, uh, the, oscillations of the molecule and the oscillations of the microwave field. That's this beat note. And the decay of this beat note gives you the coherence time. So on this transition here, we get a, a coherence time of 0.6 milliseconds when the, when the axial field gradient is 30 gauss per centimeter. On the 41 gigahertz transition, which of course is the, is the better one, less sensitive to magnetic fields, um, this is the data. You have to notice the change in the time scale here. We get a coherence time of 6.4 milliseconds. In this particular case, the, the, the field gradient was 45 gauss per centimeter. So this coherence time here you know, is already getting to be pretty useful. Um, and it's also interesting to think about what is limiting it. Um, and we've been modeling uh, the, the, the experiment and actually find nice agreement with the, with the data. So in this, um, these experiments here, the limitation is actually the very large size of the, of the molecular cloud that we have. Okay, so we take this very large distribution of molecules. It's a few millimeters across and put it into the magnetic trap. And now the range of magnetic fields that the molecule C is governed by the initial size, uh, uh, this large initial size of the cloud. Okay, so, so actually if we could compress the, compress the molecular cloud, make it a lot smaller, then we would expect these coherence times to go up uh, in proportion. And it's interesting to think, you know, what is kind of the fundamental limit um, of the coherence time you might expect here. So I like to think of you know, compressing the clouds to a very tiny point and then putting it into the middle of the magnetic trap and then let it go and it sloshes around in the trap. Um, and now the range of magnetic fields that the molecule C is now just determined by the temperature. Okay, so the temperature tells you the range of magnetic fields that the molecule C, the range of magnetic fields tells you the range of transition frequencies and, and that tells you what the dephasing time will be. So the answer to the answer to that in what I call in the temperature limited regime, uh, you would expect the coherence time to be seven seconds per microkelvin. Okay, if the molecules were a micro, if you could get into this temperature limited regime and get the molecules at a microkelvin, the coherence time would be seven seconds. Obviously, we're very very far away from that, um, but I like to put this up to show you what, what what might be achievable in the future. Now, of course, you also might wonder: Are there other de decoherence mechanisms that actually have nothing to do with the magnetic trap. Um, so we also looked at the rotational coherence times in free space. It's again on this 41 gigahertz transition. So, so here's the data uh, in free space. We see a coherence time of 16 milliseconds. And this is just limited by the random motion of the molecules. Uh, now they're not trapped. Um, at, this experiment was done at, at 50 microkelvin. So the, the molecules just move in a straight line, uh, uh, in a random direction between one, uh, one pi by two pulse and the next pi by two pulse, that changes their phase in a random way, and that's what's, uh, what's responsible for the, de de for the dephasing here. That dephasing you can actually take out with a spin echo. Uh, so we do that, we apply the spin echo, and now we see much longer coherence times. Here's the oscillation still going on after 32 milliseconds. And actually, in this case, once we apply the spin echo, we actually couldn't see any, any decoherence at all. We see the loss of molecules because the cloud is expanding and, and dropping out of the field of view. But we couldn't see any, any decoherence, and we set this lower limit to the coherence time of 47 milliseconds. OK, so that's the story I wanted to tell you about coherence times. Um, if I, do I have a couple? Then I just take a, a minute or two to, to say uh, about some um, current directions with calcium fluoride uh, in London. 
Um, so we're trying uh, hard to look for collisions between calcium fluoride molecules and rubidium atoms. Um, actually, already about a year ago, we made a, a, a dual MOT of calcium fluoride molecules and, and rubidium atoms. This is a picture um, of, of the two MOTs together. And we were able to, to um, load both species together into a magnetic trap, and we actually looked for collisions between the two species. We couldn't see anything, um, and, and really the reason is that we, we, well, we retrofitted a rubidium MOT to the calcium fluoride MOT. Um, so we just added a rubidium dispenser and try to load from the background, background rubidium vapor. And when you do that, well, you can get a lot of atoms, but you can only get a lot of atoms when you have a high background pressure, in which, in which case you have a short magnetic trap lifetime. So we need, we need both. We need lots of atoms and a long magnetic trap lifetime to be able to see collisions. So to, to that end, we've built now a, a, new, experiment, a new experiment, new apparatus. Um, here's a little photograph of it uh, where we load the rubidium uh, via the two, a 2D rubidium MOT on the sidearm here. That loads uh, 3D rubidium MOTs uh, very, very rapidly, and we actually make really huge MOTs. And just uh, in the last week, we were able to get our first calcium fluoride MOTs into this new machine. Um, so we're optimistic that uh, we'll be able to see collisions between the two species pretty soon. If you want to know more about this, then uh, Hannah has a, has a poster, so please ask Hannah about the details. And we're also um, trying to get molecules into tweezer traps. And to do that, we've built, um, we've built an apparatus. To do that, we actually couldn't find, we couldn't see any way to, to, to put the lenses needed to make the tweezer traps um, into our MOT chamber and still have a MOT. Uh, so we've actually built this in, in a second uh, vacuum chamber, which is connected to the MOT chamber with magnetic transport from, from one place to another. And uh, we're working hard now to try and get all of that up and running. So with that, uh, let me finish. And let me thank uh, all of the group members, both past and present, who've contributed um, to this work. And let me especially highlight uh, Luke and Hannah and Stefan. They're all here at the front. Um, and uh, Stefan is now at the Fritz Haber Institute. And these are the three people who've really been instrumental in, uh, in making all of this stuff happen. And then let me thank you for your attention.